So we do have a number of presentations today, 10 case presentations, and I think this promises to be as interesting and as exciting as the last case this morning. So without further delay, I think we should get started. So is John Carroll in the house? He's the first presenter. We don't see him. Um, why don't we move on to the second speaker and to start uh, is Mark Riccardi. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so I was assigned this topic here. How did this happen? It's a taver gone bad. So this is a patient who's uh, 68, had a trifecta 23 millimeter valve placed in uh, 2013 for AS. It's had worsening um, valve velocities over time with a recent heart failure hospitalization. This is not a uh, PPM case, not a patient prosthesis mismatch case. It's had worsening velocities. Um, indexed aortic valve area 0 0.4 with an EF 65%. Uh, we evaluate him for uh, TAVR instead of a redo surgery. He had a CT scan. I'm going to show you some of the snippets here, but there's an annulus diameter of 19, perimeter 66, area of 287. So it had some STJ calcium, not bad. STJ diameter was 25. The sinus was 27, mean diameter was 27 millimeters. There was a short uh, sinus height, 11 millimeters on the left and 15 on the right. Low corner is the uh, left uh, coronary was just 4.2 millimeters. As you can see on uh, this image here, the right was a little low but not bad at 9. And then the, um, the prosthesis to left uh, coronary distance was uh, 5 millimeters, which we can talk about a little bit later. So procedural issues and plan, this trifecta valve like I think everybody knows has the pericardial tissue leaflets attached on the exterior of the stented valve frame uh, to allow it to open more fully and give uh, good uh, residual gradients, I guess. It's notorious in the TAVR world because you can't expand this valve, or at least we think today we can't. I think we're going to learn more soon. Uh, but it's getting a little notorious in our world because of these uh, inability to crack it, but also the fact that these leaflets are ex uh, external to the frame, which uh, risk coronary obstruction. Um, so other considerations will, were that these leaflets will stand up straight, creating essentially a tube graft that's going to be 17 millimeters tall and 21 millimeters in diameter. So when we're thinking about coronary obstruction, this, this tube graft here is of concern because of the short SOV heights, 11 to 15 uh, millimeters. So the top of this tube graft will actually be higher than the STJ. Since the STJ is 25 and this two grab is 21, we should have four millimeters of clearance around this trifecta. So uh, alternative procedures like the basilica, not that I'm an expert in that, uh, were thought not necessary. However, the risk of coronary obstruction is real. We re uh, his uh, surgical options, options were re-reviewed. He was still de deemed a uh, very high risk for surgery to his lung disease primarily. So uh, surgery was still offered to him, but uh, he and the family opted not to do this. He had a bad experience with this first go around. So the procedure plan or some thoughts were, should we use a balloon expandable um, S3? The advantage is very easy, I think, to protect the main, uh, easy to access uh, afterward if something horrible were to happen. Disadvantage, of course, all or none, sudden phenomenon, potentially with the balloon expandable. It's also going to be a pretty small valve for this big fella. And then uh, self-expanding with an Evolute R, the advantage is, of course, you can recapture if you do see occlusion and maybe send them the OR at that point. Disadvantage is that it's a little more difficult to access those coronaries should it occlude. So our decision was made to deploy an Evolute R, a 23 millimeter valve, deploy it to 80 percent when the valve leaflets are opening and functioning, uh, wait a few minutes and then do an aortogram and see if that left main coronary has occluded or not. We figured if we saw a brisk flow at this point, we'd fully deploy. Um, and if not, if we saw a slow flow or not good flow down that main, we just recapture abort and, like I said, may send for that surgical AVR. So here's the 23 Evolute R across this trifecta valve. Trifecta valves are a little hard to see, but there it is. So here we're uh, now uh, deployed to 80 percent. The valve, I think, looks pretty decent within the trifecta. We waited seven minutes. Uh, and did a, an aortogram, and I think you see very brisk flow. We never see the right fill in too much. It's not a large right, but there's very brisk flow uh, down the left main. Thinking uh, seven or eight minutes have passed at this point, so we'll fully deploy. We do that. <clears throat> we do an aortogram. We still see nice brisk flow there. We post dilate with a 20 millimeter true balloon because of residual grade of 15. I gave myself that cutoff of uh, 15, whether we we're going to post dilate or not. So I stay with the plan. Post-dilled that, of 
course, did another aerogram. We still see brisk flow down that uh, left main. So we do our final leg shots. We do our all cases. We're done. Patient's off the table. Call for next, and I'll go talk to the family. While I'm talking to the family, I get a page. Um, patient's off the table. He's got, he's has some chest discomfort. He's hemodynamically stable. He actually looks pretty okay. Do a quick echo. Um, his ventricle looks, looks fine. Uh, but because of our concern, we put him back on the table uh, and do another aortogram, which we, uh, which we see here. It seems like he still has pretty brisk flow down that uh, left main. Blood pressure starts to soften a little bit. Put a T, intubate him, put a T probe down there. It's not helpful at all. We can't see the mouth of the left main. We figure let's put an impella in, buy some time, get a little evolute interaction there and uh, kinking of that uh, damn thing. So uh, we, we say, well, this is very, very quick. Just put them on ECMO. We've heard a lot of people go, uh, changing their times to decision making about getting an echo. But we put them on ECMO. Just give me a minute, see if I can selectively intubate this main with the JL. This is our wire. We're a little bit outside the main and, uh, you know, a little... Uh, I used to play darts, so I was able to get this wire down there. Uh, we do a selective angiogram now. It's pretty impressive. Trifecta valve. So that's clearly not where you want that leaflet to be. So uh, we put a, a, a 5 0 stent, uh, position it, uh, deploy it. Uh, we did this in favor of pulling the pull evolute up, of course, but we, we decided this might be an okay way to go. We do some post-stent angiograms, which I think look pretty good. We left the uh, stent out inside the frame a little bit of that core valve. We now put the impella in this time, maybe a little less hurried and a little uh, with a better result to, on vent, uh, to vent his ventricle. So what were the lessons learned here? We got subacute. <laughs> Uh, coronary occlusion is real. We know delayed coronary occlusion is real. I mean, this is real stuff, uh, especially with these uh, expanding valves. The night and all took a little time and maybe uh, pushed that leaflet further towards the main. Maybe there was a little clot or something. We had reversed them after the leg shot. Uh, maybe we got a little clot behind there. Uh, maybe these measurements are just not perfect. Uh, we were kind of talking in millimeters here, and uh, maybe they're just not perfect measurements, of course. Maybe that leaflet tore. Uh, and created this. So some questions that were asked, should we have done a basilic up front? I'm sure a lot of people would say yes. Should we have started by protecting the main up front? Uh, that's, uh, and then last thing is, is seven minutes, you know, where do we pick this time? How much time do you need to pass before you do your final aerogram? We waited seven minutes. Was that was not, not good. In retrospect, also, was this trifecta leaflet uh, too close for comfort? Uh, this is that aerogram magged up for us here. I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe, maybe you could see it. Maybe an artogram is not enough. Maybe you've got to do selective coronary angiography, like we learned back in the 60s. Uh, and then maybe there's some other stuff going on, uh, not to del delve too deep into my, uh, my brain. But we all have a certain amount of confirmation bias when we're conflicted. We have cognitive dissonance, and we also have motivated reasoning, right? The tending, tendency to accept what we want to believe a lot more easily and with less analysis than uh, uh, than otherwise. So we scrutinize much less when things don't go our way, and I think we kind of could have been a little more careful in our interpretation of the angiogram doing a selective uh, coronary angiogram for this case. Thank you. There's a question. Oh. Hey, just a question. So, be easy on me, Danny. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know the exact answer to that, but I agree with you. These, these are not the biggest sinuses in the world at all. Um, so I think, you know, not enough. Yeah. Mark. Why the remarkable distance to take a patient out of that condition? About 50% mortality we have in patients that have fallen out of that. Yeah. So you should be congratulated if you take the patient out of that condition. Thanks. Uh, great case, Mark. Um, I agree with you. I think that your autogram actually showed that, you know, it looks fine at that time. Mm -hmm. But I think the leaflet's probably split after you give that post-balloon inflation. So maybe at that point, yeah. you could have did a selective. And yeah. Uh, we, we, and, you know, in the literature, it does suggest that people who have a post-dill are a little more, little more common. That's a great point. Maybe that uh, sealed the deal. Good. Thanks very much.
So uh, next case, I just want to invite Anupama Shivaraju, a great save. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's see if I can exit out of this. So I did have a, a great save case uh, put together, and then I saw a few of these similar cases being presented yesterday, and then I have more of a got lucky case that I thought I'd start with and then still present the great case as well. I should be able to get through both of these cases in the allotted time. So the first case is a 78-year-old gentleman had symptomatic severe aortic stenosis. He had a new lung mass that had a biopsy-proven squamous cell carcinoma. Pulmonary and oncology that's seeing him said he has a good one-year prognosis, but go ahead and proceed with taking care of it, his valve so then we can do chemo radiation, shrink that mass, and, and take him to surgery. So in terms of medical and surgical history, he has um, COPD, not on any home oxygen. He's had a prior cabbage. His SDS is, is low, but uh, we're doing this, we're proceeding with Taver just because of the urgency of him <coughs> needing to get that surgical uh, resection of his mass. On echo, he meets the gradients in terms of it being severe. And on cath, he had all uh, three graphs that were patent. So this is just to show the, his pre-cath echo showing severe uh, aortic valve stenosis. Since I put this together yesterday, I borrowed this, the three months year report just to show in terms of CT sizing. I usually do my own CT sizing. And I size based on mean diameter and not so much on area or perimeter. Um, and we predominantly do use Sapien 3 in, in our, at our institution. So based on the CT measurements, we looked at the coronary heights, SDJ, everything was pretty straightforward. We decided to go with the 23 valve. Um, we uh, had moved forward and we're doing conscious sedation. We do have a new surgeon starting with us and until he gets to the comfort level, we've sadly been uh, going back to now reintubating the patient and putting a TE probe down, uh, which in this case saved us. So get our implant angle, we put in a 26 Sapien 3 valve. Everything goes pretty straightforward, no surprises at this point. So then we look at our post-deployment echo. Um, there's just trivial regurgitation, nothing surprising. The catheter and wire come out and the um, color Doppler come off and then we see this. So just to give you a little background in that, we always have a tendency to say give heparin. We hear the anesthesiologist confirm that they've heard and that they've given heparin. The anesthesiologist confirmed that they heard that heparin was given and right before I usually take the valve in the device, I have a tendency to ask for what the ACT is. At that point, uh, the tech that usually checks our ACT said, well, heparin wasn't given. Keep in mind, at this point, we've already done the pre-ballooning. Um, we hadn't taken the device in the body as yet. So we go ahead and give the heparin bolus. We wait about a minute or two. Then we go ahead with the device, because now we've given a large bolus of heparin. We deploy the device. The sheath was in already. We suctioned, uh, we pulled negative back on the sheath, made sure that there wasn't any thrombus in there before we took the device in. But yes, the whole time the sheath had been in there without heparin in the patient system. So before we deployed the valve, pulled negative on the sheath, made sure there was no thrombus, took the device across after waiting about a, a good minute or so after heparin was given. Literally right after we deployed this valve, we see this, and then it became the debate of what do we do? How do we get that out? So there's a clear thrombus that's attached, and it looks like it's plopping through the valve into the uh, ascending aorta. Any thoughts on what anyone would do? So after much debate, we truly decided to just take our chances with it. We gave him high-dose heparin. We uh, kept him in-house until his Coumadin was therapeutic, between two and a half to three and a half range. We sent him home, and he came back a month and a half later, and his valve is working beautifully well. There's no thrombus that I see, so you can see that's the before. Uh, immediately after procedure, and this is a month and a half of him just being on Coumadin and heparin um, and anticoagulating. <laughs> he did not have a stroke. <laughs> there was no ischemic bowel. There was no peripheral ischemia. Um, I'd like to think that it just magically disappeared. <laughs> um, so in pre and post, in, uh, um, the echo pre showed a severe gradient, and then his gradient at a month and a half was less than 10. So 
take home points from this one is that confirmed with anesthesiologists that heparin was actually given, wait until the ACT before even uh, inserting the valve into the body, and then sometimes just leaving things alone is the right option and not try to be too heroic trying to suck that clot out and creating more problems for yourselves. Now I agree with you. So the second case, which was actually a great save, um, it, pretty straightforward in the 90-year-old lady, critical aortic valve stenosis, symptomatic, coming in. Um, SDS score kind of falls in the intermediate risk. She's 90, she's frail, intermediate risk. We decided to proceed with TAVR for her. Her echo parameters are consistent with more critical aortic valve stenosis. She has non-obstructive coronary disease, maybe uh, intermediate lesion in her mid-LAD. Again, uh, the long and short axis showing that uh, it is a tri-leaflet valve, even though here it kind of gives you the illusion that it probably isn't. So CTA measurements for her, her mean diameter was, you know, probably 20.5 to close to maybe 21. Uh, her coronary heights, her right coronary height was plenty high, it was 13.4, her left was 9.1. Then we looked at the left uh, leaflet itself, it didn't le it seem extremely uh, larger compared to the other, and there wasn't... Most of the, the calcium seemed seem to be more on the right coronary leaflet and not so much on the, on the left and the non. We had our TE measurements as well. Just to confirm, we got our implant angle. There was a debate between putting a 20 and a 23, so we decided to take a 20 balloon and balloon size it. I also put the 20 in just to kind of see how that leaflet behaved uh, in terms of the left main height and how the calcium behaved. And there were some telling signs that probably at this point should have uh, made us think, just go ahead and protect that left main. Um, but we had everything in the room and we just were silly and decided to proceed with deploying the valve um, and taking our, our chances with it. So as soon as we deploy it, she is hypotensive and then her blood pressure actually surprisingly recovers and then we saw that flow, sorry. You see that sluggish flow in the left system. We just made sure that there wasn't any significant MR and no significant AI, no pericardial effusion. You can see the short axis view of the LV before the TAVR and then after you can see the whole lateral wall now being hypokinetic. So um, I just uh, decided to take a selective angiogram so I put uh, a catheter uh, uh, XB35 catheter into the left main and took selective angiogram. You do see flow. I haven't done anything at this point. You're seeing TME3 flow in, in the coronary system. And then on this view, you can see the calcium coming up. There's definitely uh, involvement. It, you, you see the calcium, calcium obstructing part of the left main. It's not obstructing it completely. What I, what I didn't capture is then I decided to take a quick picture of the right coronary as well and it took a JR4 catheter, and when we took the initial injection under fluoroscopy, there was a large filling defect in the mid-RCA. And that's what prompted me to put that wire down, down. and the moment I put the wire down that, and took an angiogram, that defect was gone. I wanted to make sure it didn't embolize anywhere distally, and it didn't. As you can see, there's good myocardial blushing. I don't see it anywhere in the PDA or, P, uh, PDA or PL. So I took that uh, left catheter out and decided to proceed with stenting that left main because I didn't want to leave that calcium obstructing. So we took a 4-5 stent, deployed it, and then post-dilated with a, a 5-0 balloon, and then got good flow in the coronary system, in our left coronary system with uh, no residual defect, really. And then just took another final selective angio just to make sure there was flow in both coronaries. And then again, this is the echo on the right that showed you right after we deployed the valve with the lateral wall being hypokinetic. And then the one on, on the other side is after we've deployed the stent to show that that LV did recover. And her gradient was, well, I saw her. She's eight months out from her tavern. She just followed up with me last month and she's been doing well and actually she's uh, out dancing. And takeaway points for this is that coronary obstruction, even though it's rare, it's life-threatening. And when you have coronary heights less than 10, you have long native leaflets with heavy calcium. If you have a small sinus of Valsalva, 
or uh, as Dr. Ricciardi just pointed out with the last case, when you have valve and valve, especially with mitral flow trifecta that have leaflets on the outside, these all increase your risk of, of coronary obstruction. So it's important to do a careful assessment and look at your images and have a plan in play, whether you decide to protect the left main or do a basilica or decide not to even just proceed with TAVR. So thank you. If you, can if you can stay here for a second. I have a quick question. I think on your first angiogram, when the balloon was inflated, we could not see the ostium of the left main clearly. I think it was more on the uh, irregular view. I think probably that would have given you a better clue. I think the left main was occluded then. Right. On, uh, on the second case with the balloon. On the first, yeah, on the second case, absolutely. <laughs> we started by thinking that we tear leaflets of the R cases of stent test valve of a form of coronary obstruction. And then came patients with bovine pericardial stenotic leaflets and we did it in CC. And then came patients with native AS and we did it in Mr. C. And it seems to be that in recent past there is a significant growth, especially in native AS stubborn procedures coming from the CD. Huh? And this case is a risk for coronary obstruction. Great, thank you. Uh, excellent cases. I've just heard news from Dominique that actually John Carroll is actually doing a mitral clip case, so he won't be here this morning for his <laughs> presentation. So we've got a lot of room for discussion. Uh, our next uh, presenter is Dr. Chet Kligger, um, and uh, this will be a complex valve in valve therapy case. So thank you, Paul, and the organizers for the invitation. These are my disclosures. So I was put to the task uh, to do a complex uh, valve and valve case. So my case, this is an 82-year-old female with a past medical history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. She had prior cabbage or bypass surgery 20 years prior uh, with a lima to an LED and a vein graft to an OM and OM1 and OM2. <clears throat> followed, followed in 2000 with an AVR and mitral valve replacement uh, with a 25-millimeter millimeter magna pericardial valve in the mitral position. She has chronic uh, stage three kidney disease and chronic pancreatitis and came to us with three months of shortness of breath. So here's her transthoracic echo. You can see uh, normal ejection fraction on this view, uh, thickened leaflets, bi severe bioprosthetic mitral stenosis, and you can see the anti-grade mitral gradient uh, is in, in near uh, a mean of 20 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the gradient across the, the mitral valve, or excuse me, the aortic valve was mildly elevated and she had mild aortic valve uh, dysfunction. So thickened leaflets on the transesophageal echo on the right, you can see 
the difficulty in uh, valve lethal excursion uh, with some central mitral regurgitation. So as we do our reconstructive CT and we think about uh, valve and valve therapy, we're clearly concerned about LVOT obstruction. And you can envision if you put a mitral valve and you post the leaflets of this pericardial valve that the risk for outflow obstruction is not going to be low in this patient. So if you create the new LVOT using the three Mencio software, as many of us do for this therapy, it was borderline around 180. The question was, was this a safe therapy to actually proceed with uh, valve and valve? Thinking of bailout options for her, uh, the coronary angiogram revealed a patent lima to an LED and patent graft. Her native right system was normal. Um, she had mid-LED occlusion right after the first septal, and you can see there's a 99% stenosis uh, at the ostium of that uh, septal perforator. Some would say that uh, this would be difficult for an alcohol septal ablation. Maybe it's actually quite easy if you can dissect that, uh, that uh, severe stenosis. You may actually knock out the uh, that septum and actually open up the LVOT. So uh, based on our heart team approach, the STS score was about 10%. She was deemed inoperable for a second reoperative uh, sternotomy, and uh, we decided to proceed with a mitral valve and valve implantation. So we took the next steps. Uh, eight French sheath was placed, as we've seen uh, mitral valve and valves performed here uh, on the case presentations. Pre-closed on the left, uh, put a Langston catheter on the right to check gradients across the LVOT and, and aortic valve. Uh, did our transeptal puncture, uh, put the agilis sheath, got the, uh, the pigtail to run out the anterior wall of the uh, left ventricle, uh, placed our pre-shaped uh, confita wire, which we like to use. Uh, originally, when we were doing these, we were railing out the apex and putting even Lunderquist wires. Now with the confita wire, safer for, uh, for the LV. Did our balloon septostomy with the 12 millimeter Mustang balloon and made sure that we were able to drive this uh, across into, uh, into the uh, mitral prosthesis. So what we decided to do to assess for LVOT obstruction, they've done uh, true fuller balloons, which are perfusion balloons. I just show it on the right with the center lumen that's open in the aortic position as they position uh, mitral valves uh, to prevent LVOT obstruction. This is uh, something that's been reported before. We, we actually use the perfusion balloon to post uh, the, the leaflets of the pericardial valve to assess gradients. So we had the pigtail, uh, Langston pigtail across the aortic valve. And as you can see on the right, the peak to peak gradient uh, before uh, the balloon uh, inflation was about 40 and after it was 40. So based on this, uh, with the 24 millimeter balloon, we thought that it was safe uh, to proceed, that we wouldn't have to worry about LVOT obstruction. So during our inflation using uh, TEE guidance, uh, transgastric view, you can see that there's no color turbulence uh, in the outflow, and uh, we pulse wave through the outflow tract, and it looked good. We took the next step, proceeded with the uh, anti-grade approach, uh, took a 26 millimeter S3 valve, cross, positioned it nicely, uh, positioned it with the distal edge at the stent struts, and uh, got a nice deployment with about 10 to 15 percent on the atrial side. And you can see on the echo uh, after deployment that uh, there really wasn't much turbulence uh, across the outflow of the, uh, of the LV. And we pulsed it, spent some time uh, looking at the system, and, and everything looked great. So we thought we were good. Took the system out, hemodynamics were great, <clears throat> and the patient was doing well. And you can see uh, just looking at, the, um, looking at the, the turbulence and looking at the gradients post that there was no change uh, from when we had started the case. So five minutes after deployment of the S3 valve, um, she became hypotensive. Blood pressure dropped to 50. Uh, we quickly put an impella CP in the left ventricle, uh, decided to upsize the, the left system where we were. Up, well, actually, she already had the E sheath in. Uh, we put the impella through it, uh, gave her blood, fluids, and then we're trying to understand uh, what had occurred. So our echocardiographer had identified that there was no LVOT obstruction. <clears throat> we already had the pigtail across uh, previously, and then we started looking for effusion. Uh, we realized that there was no uh, clear effusion on TEE, uh, but there was, seemed to be some organized uh, material around, around the heart. The decision was made because we couldn't see very well in transesophageal echo to do a dyna CT on the table, and we did see a, a pericardial effusion more towards the apex. On a transthoracic view, you can see nicely, it took us a little while to, uh, to figure this out. Um, I actually put a needle in the space before we were able to identify with the transthoracic probe. But you can see clearly to and fro flow uh, that with the wire, we lacerated the, the LV. 
On the right CFA, what we decided to do is pre-close. We upgraded to a 16 French cannula. The, the patient was actually stable with the, the impella. Um, put, in, put her on pump uh, via the right side, via an A and V, uh, a &V cannulas, and were able to remove the impella catheter. Our surgeons did a uh, left uh, thoracotomy, exposed the LV, patched uh, and, and, and directly sutured the left ventricle with pledged sutures, and were able to repair the LV successfully. Uh, on transthoracic, this is our post-transthoracic image. You can see uh, limited pericardial fusion, but LV back to normal, and this is her being off pump. And I will say that six months post, uh, she's actually asymptomatic and, and doing well living independently. So some take-home points for us is that you can use the perfusion balloon uh, as a way to assess neo-LVT obstruction. Uh, clearly, LV laceration due to a preformed shaped guide wire is rare. Um, but can be, uh, can happen. So this has been reported with the Lunderquist wire uh, across the LV, uh, but now we've seen it, uh, we had it happen to us using a confita wire, uh, but early detection for this is, is you know, uh, early detection um, is essential and without it could be fatal. Uh, LV laceration, the setting of prior cardiac surgery could be a challenge to identify on, on at least on transesophageal echo and uh, pre-procedural planning I think is, is uh, is key that allows you to really get full percutaneous access. And for this case, uh, we really didn't have to do cut downs on the groin. So luckily, a challenging case, we were worried about LVOT obstruction. In the end, the patient did well from that regard, uh, but uh, suffered from an LV laceration, which we were able to bail out. So thank you very much. China, I had a quick question. Uh, not only the wire, I think the ballooning might have had some effect as well in pushing that wire across. Do you think that might have been a So, um, yeah, very, so the question was, was it the perfusion balloon? I mean, yeah. if, you know, if you think about the timing when we were fully anticoagulated, um, she was stable the whole time. It was when we actually had taken out the entire system um, that she had crashed. So, I mean, if you look at the time delay from when we had inflated the balloon, kept it up for a couple minutes, um, the, the time was pretty long. So definitely a possibility, but uh, I'm not sure. Did you consider percutaneous closure of the uh, apical laceration at the time? So it's, it's a laceration, not, not a, a whole perforation. So, you know, you saw it nicely on the transthoracic image, and it took a little while to find it, but uh, it's, it was a tear in the ventricle. Uh, To Dr. Reardon's point, is there a chance that you could fool yourself by inducing a gradient with that balloon so far across yes. that yes. you know you then end up doing things that you may not have had to do? Yeah, of course. I mean, the goal for us was to to end the balloon at the distal edge of the at, of the valve, uh, and you're going to post the leaflet, so it's not te technically the S3 valve; it's the leaflets of the pericardial valve. Um, but agree, you don't want to drive it too far into the ventricle. Um, You drop float, yeah. Into your LA, and how will that affect the physiology of the stroke volume going through your aorta? So if you, if you saw the, the gradients, the peak-to-peak -peak gradients, you, there was a drop in pressures. So, you know, clearly with the balloon inflated, you... Some of your stroke volumes go down to the LA. True. I just, I'm just trying to think about it. I just wonder if, if, if you, it may not be a true test of... Uh, true, true. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the next case is uh, by 
is on practical pulmonary process placement by Dominic Victor. Thank you. Thanks very much. Welcome to Denver. Hope you guys have a chance to explore our city and, and what our great state has to offer. It's a beautiful time of year. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to present today. So I'm sort of going to walk through um, very practically our approach at the University of Colorado um, to pulmonary valve replacement, uh, transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. Um, this isn't the most straightforward case. I added this case because it has some nuance to it um, and uh, allows me to sort of discuss some of the some of the challenges and things to watch out for. So in general, um, we'll cover sort of what our approach is to pre-procedure imaging, access, uh, the wires that we use for uh, delivering the device, device sizing, which is uh, very different from what most of us are familiar with, with TAVR, uh, and really um, highlights the, the, the need and the evolution of, of these therapies from uh, where we started to where we are today and hopefully where we're going. Um, uh, the role for balloon sizing, which we generally don't use in the aortic valve position, and really importantly, um, the nuanced uh, determination of uh, coronary compression and, and how to interpret those findings. And then we'll go through the delivery and deployment of the valve, and finally, uh, closure and post-procedure uh, care. So I'll present the case of a 30-year-old woman. She's got a history of tetralogy of Fallot. She actually had a, a classic right BT shunt and subsequent transannular patch um, as an infant. Uh, she's had issues with ventricular tachycardia and had an ICD placed. Um, a lot of branch pulmonary artery stenosis and has had multiple interventions with stents placed in uh, bilateral branch PAs at the ostium as well as the segmental branches of her pulmonary arteries. She's had long-standing moderate to severe pulmonary insufficiency with some subtle um, progressive symptoms. So pre-procedure imaging um, in the in the pulmonary valve space is a little bit different from that in the aortic valve space uh, in that once we do a CT scan for someone who's going to have TAVR, we already have the indication. We know they have severe aortic stenosis, and, and we know that they um, need an aortic valve replacement. Whereas with pulmonary valve insufficiency, especially in someone who's got congenital heart disease and has longstanding PI from either a valvotomy or transannular patch, it may not be clear when, when to actually time these interventions. And imaging is really helpful, and there's um, some data to suggest that there's RV volume cutoffs um, at which in asymptomatic patients we should move forward with pulmonary valve replacement. Um, it allows us to determine the anatomy, most importantly, what the prior repair was, uh, whether there's a valve conduit, a bioprosthesis, or whether it's a transannular patch and what the location of that patch is, the proximity of the coronary arteries uh, to the right ventricular outflow tract, uh, which becomes really important and is one of the more common reasons to uh, abort these procedures. Um, and sometimes it's, it's pretty nuanced where coronaries look very far away on cross-sectional imaging, but you get in and do testing and it's abnormal. But some anatomies, especially most commonly an anomalous LED from the right coronary artery which runs across the, uh, the RVOT, those are clear sort of upfront contraindications that you know you're not going to be able to do this uh, before you subject the patient to a procedure. And, and in the end, really, we're determining whether the anatomy is suitable for transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. So here's our echocardiogram. Um, for those who don't do a lot of congenital heart disease imaging and echo interpretation, uh, severe PI is really easy to miss, and this is pretty demonstrative of that. So when you look at colored Dopplers with severe PI, this happens quite commonly where patients get um, echocardiograms done in the community where folks don't have experience with congenital heart disease, and it gets interpreted as no or mild PI because the, the duration of the pulmonary insufficiency without a valve there is so short that it's really easy to miss by colored Doppler. Um, so firstly, you have to sort of think about it and know that it's a possibility. And uh, secondly, spectral Doppler is really important here uh, to sort this out very clearly. Uh, you have you know, severe PI with um, uh, early normalization of pressures. So here's a CT scan uh, that'll run through. So you see the transannular patch there with the calcium. I'll let it run through again just so we can orient ourselves. Um, so here's her RV. It's uh, moderately to severely enlarged with the end diastolic volume of indexed of 172 mLs per meter squared, which is, uh, which is pretty big and sort of above the cutoff where we like to do this. Um, so both PAs are stented, so branch PA uh, stenting, and that becomes important when we look at the imaging from the case uh, and something to be cognizant of if patients have branch PA stenting because it can make um, parts of this procedure very challenging. And you see in the area that's very anterior behind the sternum, uh, you see this patch here that's very calcified. So this is the reason why the surgeons didn't want to operate on it. So essentially a patch, and RVOT plastered up against the sternum, uh, high risk for um, bleeding issues and needing to go on pump before you even open the chest. So I thought that 
uh, transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement was a good first start. So uh, pulmonary valve sizing. So in bioprostheses, this is pretty easy. We, we use the valve and valve app. Um, the congenital interventionalists like the balloon size thing. So even if we know what size bioprosthesis it is, we oftentimes will balloon size just to make sure there's not significant pandas in growth to make sure we get good expansion of the valve. But really what we do um, in native RBOTs and, and patches, we'll, we'll take angiograms. Uh, biplane is really helpful in this as opposed to other transcatheter valve replacement. I wouldn't say it's um, absolutely necessary, but it makes life easier and spares contrast dose because you need these two views to make accurate measurements. So we'll measure both in, with um, catheter across uh, and native measurements and then we'll also balloon size. So we usually take a 40 millimeter, 30 or 40 millimeter, depending on the size of the conduit uh, or pre-procedure imaging. Uh, this is a PTS sizing balloon. Uh, and we'll go ahead and sort of inflate to the port point where we have a waist, and then we'll go ahead and measure the waist. So what you'll, I'll just point out, you notice that the nose of the balloon is actually into the LPA stent, which low pressure balloon inflation, it's fine, but uh, it'll become important later uh, to, to be aware that this is interacting with that stent for two reasons. Number one, valve positioning, and number two, what I'll show you happened in this case, uh, which is balloon rupture. So here's our measurements. Um, we oftentimes will verify these. They're not always accurate, so I will usually go on our CT measurements and then balloon sizing, uh, but clearly above the range of, of a melody valve, which maxes out at 22 or 24 millimeters if you really push it. Um, so clearly, a melody valve is not going to work here. So uh, same concept, we'll reinflate the balloon and then uh, test the coronary. So the right coronary artery is well out of the way, no need to test that, but the left coronary artery, uh, of course, relatively closely, not super close, but a lot of times we see tissue block movement in block. So even if it's very remote from the RVOT, we'll see sort of tissue in the mediastinum get pushed and indirectly compress the coronary. So even if it looks by CT like it's a mile away, it's important to do this because uh, this is really a, a life-threatening complication. And it's not, it's just like, it's essentially like TAVR. It's really hard to rescue this because once it's compressed, it's hard to wire, it's hard to get equipment down. So it's best avoided. Um, in terms of delivery system management, so this is the uh, Edward Sapien III delivery system. It's a commander delivery system with the E sheath, which is uh, the case I'm going to show you. Um, very different than TAVR in terms of sheath positioning valve loading. So uh, in TAVR, we always advance the sheath to make sure that the white portion of the sheath is in the vessel. With uh, transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement, you have to leave that sheath hanging out because you're going to load the valve onto the balloon in the IVC. If you put the sheath all the way in, you're going to be in the right atrium and you're not going to be able to load the valve. So it's important to leave it out uh, up front so that you don't dilate your venotomy and have bleeding. Um, just something that's a little bit different. Um, the, the commander delivery system is night and day, 100% improvement over the, over the um, old NovaFlex system, which was really stiff and difficult to deliver. It actually tracks pretty well, and we've not had much trouble. So here's valve deployment. Um, just to go back, crossing the valve uh, is done with a balloon tip catheter to avoid getting entangled in the tricuspid valve cordae and the trabeculations in the ventricle. And we use a uh, Lunderquist wire. Uh, and good wire position is super important with, with pulmonary valve replacement. Uh, so you have to be very deep in the PAs or else you, you'll lose wire position because there's a lot of manipulation in the right atrium usually to get these valves in place. So uh, we actually took an Edward Sapien 329 millimeter valve uh, and put plus five in the syringe. Uh, some of our CT measurements were over 30 millimeters, so we thought that we needed to be pretty aggressive with sizing here. And what you notice is, um, so a very slow valve deployment. The balloon's a little bit back in the valve, which is why it sort of expands from the ventricular side first. Uh, and what you notice is that full deployment here, the balloon actually ruptures. Uh, it's essentially perforated by that stent. Um, balloon ruptures are potentially a problem. We've had some balloons shear off, and oftentimes when they rupture uh, on their own, they rupture circumferentially and become like an umbrella, and we've had sort of our disarticulated balloons that we've had to snare. Fortunately, with this, it just perforated the tip, so the balloon was intact, and we were able to get it out pretty easily. In light of that, we weren't sure whether we had stable valve position because the balloon did rupture, so we went back and post-dilated um, with a 30-millimeter uh, um, Z-Med balloon, which wouldn't be my choice today. With true balloons, I'd probably use a true, but that's what we had at the time, uh, and notice that we have full valve expansion. In terms of uh, imaging, we use a multi-track catheter over the wire so that we can maintain wire access in case we need to post-dilate. So multi-track goes into the main PA and then we take angiograms. And you'll see here that there's really only catheter and wire associated pulmonary insufficiency. Um, and it uh, looks like good leaflet function. 
And we always measure the valves at, at the end just to get a sense of whether we're fully expanded. In this one, um, you know, we got pretty, pretty close to uh, 29 millimeters. So in terms of closure, uh, I only show this because there's um, one of my colleagues is from Great Britain where money is a big concern. And the figure of H stitch, which I put in the medieval torture devices, uh, patients hate it. Uh, and I think, frankly, um, the data supports using pre-closure veins. I don't think there's a higher risk of complications. So this is what I would recommend uh, pre-closure the same way you do with TAVR uh, for venotomy or mitral clip uh, in the vein. Or if you really want to be terrible to your patients, you can do that and go inject Lido every two hours um, overnight. But I, I, it works, but I think it's, you know, I think it's easiest just to put a couple per closes in and, and get out of Dodge. Uh, Post-procedure, you see that uh, we have good valve function, no pulmonary insufficiency, uh, acceptable gradient, so means. Means usually we get uh, with the sapien valves in the uh, low teens with pulmonary valve procedures, and um, patient is doing well. So just to highlight a couple things, uh, ICD leads are really important to be cognizant of. We've dislodged more than one. Uh, her device was at end of life, so she needed a, a replacement. So it's important not to do that before you do this. So do this first in case you knock a lead out, and the last thing you want to do is knock a fresh lead out. Um, and really, I can't, I can't overemphasize the need to be, have an iterative approach to pulmonary valve replacement. It's not like you lock in with a size and know up front, especially in native RVOTs or, or patches. It's really a dynamic process. Some of these can be very pulsatile and very compliant, so it's important to balloon size uh, and make sure you test the coronaries. Thanks very much. So I noticed that you didn't RV pace in that case. Is that something you routinely don't do? And what's your strategy? Because I saw the valve move down a little bit as you were deploying it. And would that have helped if you had RV paced? We um, rarely, if ever, RV pace. Um, and a lot of that, if we're having a hard time positioning the balloon when we size, then we'll sometimes RV pace. The, the problem with pacing um, is that you're already across the RA with a lot of bulky equipment and lead stability is an issue. So we've paced through the LV, which I don't like to do personally. Um, the coronary sinus is the other option. Uh, I think this valve moved down um, firstly the because the balloon was balloon. slipped back. And then when, once the proximal or the distal portion of the balloon inflated, it sort of milked down out of that stent. But we don't routinely pace for, for um, pulmonary valves. Okay, all right. We have our next speaker, Gilbert Tang, who will uh, talk to us about challenging case of tricuspid therapy. Thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, this could be a uh, tricuspid case. As you know, tricuspid clip uh, is an off-label procedure. So just uh, as a disclaimer. So I am the CIPI along with uh, uh, Paul Suraja and Sabo Carr for the Triluminate Triclip uh, Feasibility Study. So this is the Triclip system. Uh, essentially, it's the same as a mitral clip NT, but the guide delivery is a little bit shortened and a little bit of a uh, angulation in terms of more favorable to the tricuspid valve because the shorter distance travel. This is a prospective single arm multi-center feasibility study involving European and U.S. sites, the three in the U.S. sites, and possible expo expansion in the U.S. The pivotal trial is going to be probably next year. The criteria is moderate greater TR of NYJ class three, 2, 3, or ambulatory 4. Uh, three year follow up, the endpoint is TR reduction at one grade, uh, at least one grade 30 days, and secondary endpoint of cardiac mortality. So these are inclusion criteria. Moderate, severe, uh, or greater TR by core lab uh, has to be appropriate heart team to high risk for surgical for surgery. Uh, no indication for mitral valve intervention and suitable tricuspid anatomy uh, by imaging. Exclusion, if you have concomitants, moderate, severe, greater MR, you have to fix that first. Uh, moderate uh, pulmonary hypertension right now is an exclusion criteria. Any leaflet surgery, surgery done was excluded. Uh, pacemaker IC lead is not excluded provided that it doesn't interfere with the procedure. Uh, and all imaging. Uh, right now, age over 90 is excluded and also in dialysis. So I just want to talk to you about our first case at Mount Sinai. It's a 72-year-old female, uh, MHC class 3, peripheral edema, polycyte female, malfibrosis, on home oxygen. She has also a permanent pacemaker with AFib. She just made the criteria for uh, pulmonary hypertension. We also actually did a mitral clip repair for her uh, severe pulmonary MR a year ago uh, with ASD closure given uh, the right to left uh, shunting cross. You can see she's on optimal medical therapy already. You can see this, the baseline TEE. Uh, you can see here, the TTE routers. So you can see here, right ventricle, and anterior posterior leaflet. You don't see the pacemaker lead in this view, but I'll show you in another view. 
So one thing we learned is that if you have uh, to have a reasonable septal leaflet in terms of mobility and not over restricted, you can see that's the pacemaker lead here. And it's quite mobile. It's actually go towards the central orifice. And you can see this is the TR location, which is more along the anterior posterior, relatively central is a functional TR. And you can see here where the pacemaker lead across. The challenge with this is that how do you actually navigate the catheter around without interfering with dislodging the leak, given she's pacer dependent 70% of the time. This is a 3D T. You can see again where the lead is placed and where the TR is. So first, we went after the anterior septal uh, commissure, uh, given that is the more favorable trajectory for this particular device. You can see here this is the grasping wheel around usually 150, uh, 140 to 180 degree angle. It is a bit of a challenge within the uh, with the thinner tricuspid leaflets, how to confirm leaflet insertion. You can see this is where the clip is closed, and you really have to make sure that you have sufficient leaflet insertion to avoid uh, the risk of detachment. And we often actually would uh, re-grasp more than once just to make sure on echo we can see that and we record it so that we can get confirmation. So we also use a combination with floral. The floral has been extremely helpful, actually, in this procedure, at least in my opinion. Uh, you can see here the anterior septal and posterior leaflets are roughly in this kind of orientation, an LAO. And thankfully, in this patient, you have ASD occluder. You can also guide where the, roughly where the septum is. And you can see this is RAO, uh, roughly the trajectory of the anterior septal device. Now, this is the anterior posterior. This was our second clip target. You can see the first clip's already poor. It's a little bit closer to the commissure. We were concerned about interacting with the lead, so, and also with the mobile lead interacting with the clip acutely, they can cause the dislodgement. So we place a little bit further away. And you can see here the challenge with this particular location is that you literally have to go above the lead and then reach underneath. You can see it on floral here on the RAO view. You have to go above to maintain a, a favorable trajectory, and then you have to actually go around it. So what we do is actually the whole respiration also do about salva maneuver before we cross in the ventricle just to see how the lead uh, can shift in the position before we cross. And we actually whole uh, respiration we cross so that we actually minimize the movement of the lead when we cross into the ventricle. So here you, you can see here the transgastric is really excellent in terms of looking at the clip orientation. You can see the anterior posterior leaflets here. Uh, well, that's the previous first clip. You can see with X-Plane, you really can see the leaflets uh, pretty well here. You try to get a view where you don't have to lead across. If you have to lead across, that means you're too close to lead, so you, I would not recommend grasping there. So we actually play a little bit safe, just go a little bit more lateral. So here's the final result. You can see one clip here and the second clip here. And again, we also interrogate the uh, stability of the clips with the uh, lead. Again, we would do certain respiration maneuver to uh, mimic more physiological conditions. For example, the patient Valsalva, would that have cause a, a potential interaction with the clip? So here's the uh, pre-implant. You can see here, in terms of anatomy, this is the post-implant. That's clip number two. This is clip number one. You can see here, you know, the lead was quite mobile previously. Now that we have one clip there, certainly it'll limit the uh, mobility of the, leaf, uh, the lead somewhat. And you can see this is the pre-implant, and this is the post-implant. Really, we almost eliminated the TR at the anterior posterior segment where you can see here it was quite significant beforehand. So this is pre-implant, that's pelvis implant. This is 30 days, so she has moderate TR, and most of the TR is actually around the lead. We actually contemplated where to extract the lead and put in a micro. Uh, we've done that in the past. I, I published that before, but I think given uh, her mobilities and the lead is actually quite uh, old. We worry about, uh, you know, obviously laser lead extraction and complications associated with that. So we just enrolled her uh, study uh, into the trial without that. And you can see that's really the residual TR. So in summary, I think HUS repair tricuspid with existing patient lead is challenging, but it's feasible. Uh, really, at least in my experience, the combination of echo and floor guidance really help you put in the right spot without uh, interacting with patient lead and respiratory maneuvers can really help confirm the absence of interaction. Thank you. Uh, great case, uh, Dr. Tang. Um, I mean, the imaging seems to be a crucial uh, role here. So uh, any comments on how the uh, imaging people are uh, orienting to the whole process? Yeah, so you know, the number of papers published in uh, the literature showing the protocol essentially on TTE and TEE uh, imaging in terms of the screening these patients. We routinely, op uh, before we screen these patients, our clinic op optimize them. So work with our hospital colleagues to make sure they're op optical, medically optimized. As you know, 
uh, the loading condition can shift the tricuspid gap and also the uh, pathology quite a, quite a bit. So we optimize them, bring them to the lab, and some of the things that we learn is if they have previous mechanical valves, it's a big problem because acoustic shadowing, we learned that. Patient lead ICD is also a big problem. Not that the anatomy is not favorable, but that the imaging, the acoustic shadowing really uh, hurt you on being able to you know, do, a, do a grasp uh, at the time of procedure. So those are the things we look for at the time of screening as if you were going to do the procedure and be able to really accurately uh, determine whether the patient is suitable or not. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So the next speaker is uh, Lee McDonald. Uh, there is more, more than one way to close the hole. Thank you. Well, while I'm starting here, thank you, Paul, and the organizers for uh, giving me a chance to speak. And I also can thank one of my mentors who's sitting in the front row, Mark Ricciardi, who taught me a lot of what I do. Yeah, a lot of what I don't want to do. Um, so the title of my case is There's More Than One Way to Close a Hole. And I, we've had a whole bunch of interesting cases on tricuspid valve and aortic valve and TMVR. And I'm going to go back to the, the original structural heart procedure, which is uh, that most of us have done, which is PFO closure. So the, I've got two very brief cases. The first one is a 36-year-old who presented several years ago to an outside facility with a stroke. He had no prior medical history. Um, it was a suspected paradoxical embolus. Uh, he had a markedly positive bubble study. And after a workup and a discussion with the team and the neurologist, he decided to proceed to PFO closure. The uh, outside interventionalists attempted PFO closure, and I just included what they wrote in the report. They said the IVC was very tortuous. It appeared uh, left-sided. They said they weren't able to advance the catheter into the SVC, but they could get the swan gans somewhere close. They tried multiple catheters and could never reach the PFO. So eventually, uh, a contrast injection was performed, and they decided the patient did not have an IVC. And what this patient actually has, and I'll show you some images, is absence of the IVC with azagous continuation. And at this point, the interventionalist decided that they would abort the procedure and get a CT scan uh, for better definition of the anatomy. And just for review, uh, the azagous continuation of the IVC or absent IVC, in this case, the azagous drains kind of in the posterior portion uh, near the diaphragm and comes up around and drains into your SVC. And so you actually do not have a normal uh, IVC. And this is kind of a classic CT appearance in this. You can see, normally you can see on the right there the aorta, and then on the left, that's the large azagous draining up and around uh, into, the S, uh, into the SVC. And this is a 3D rendering, and you can see, um, so you can kind of see here the uh, IVC as it comes, and as everyone knows, normally you would see it here on the right side. On this one, it's on the left side, draining posteriorly and then would drain up uh, into the SVC. So um, with this, the, per the, uh, the person doing this procedure decided to refer um, this patient to me, and this is just another CT scan. I'll let it play through one more time where you can see uh, the contrast uh, filling um, the SVC. You can see coming up right here, you can see a really nice picture of that azagous vein draining into the um, into the SVC. So after reviewing it and discussing the options, we decided on a right internal jugular axis. And I'm sure some of you have attempted this. Uh, the TE had shown a prominent PFO. It did have somewhat of a tunnel appearance. You know, in my mind, uh, an interesting point was you would think that since the PFO tunnel is directed inferiorly, that that would perhaps be a protection since we think most of these things are embolized from the legs uh, and with the absence of an IVC that this person wouldn't. But nonetheless, we decided to proceed to uh, PFO closure. I, I accessed the right internal jugular, and it turned out to be quite difficult to pass through the, um, the PFO. I used multiple different catheters. Um, and any time I could get anything in, because of the tunnel, it would just flop right back into uh, the right atrium. And so ultimately, uh, we share a, um, a control room with one of our EP uh, uh, teams, and they were <laughs> ended up, one of them you know, came over and said, hey, why don't you use one of our steerable quad EP catheters? It's going to work very well. Obviously, now, having done a little more mitral 
uh, procedures. I think we have a lot more tools. This was a time when I wasn't doing that. But the steerable quad EP catheter is a fairly cheap catheter. It worked very well. And then I was able to telescope an eight French multi-purpose sheath uh, into there and deliver a 25 millimeter cribiform device. As you can see here um, from the approach and as in the upper uh, left panel there you can see just a different appearance than when you're normally deploying uh, from the IVC uh, but a very nice result. So that was um, that was just a reminder that there are approximately one to two percent of people that do have alternative IVC anatomies and as PFO closure grows I think you need to be aware of this if you're struggling along it may be worthwhile to take an injection and see if you have a abnormal one as i mentioned in this one the azagous continuation of the ivc is the most common one found in about one in 200 people again just to remind you there are three really other common approaches to pfo closure other than the normal one which uh, and those include the internal jugular approach the axillary approach and the hepatic approach obviously if you're going to do the hepatic approach you either need an experienced operator or some experience uh, accessing a hepatic vein. So that was one of the first cases I did in this most recent case. I debated about putting it on there because it's, it's, not a, it, it's a case that did not go extremely well, uh, but I thought it was worthwhile to show some of the difficulties you can uh, uh, get into when you're um, going from an alternative access. So this 62-year-old female presented with a basal or artery stroke, she was outside the window of TPA. She had a very complex course. She had cerebellar hemorrhage. She had uh, a craniotomy. She was noted to have a very large PFO uh, on or near presentation, and she also had bilateral large DVTs, and a filter was placed. They were going to remove the filter several weeks later after she'd been in the ICU, but they actually, and I'll show you some images, there was so much thrombus in her IVC that they decided that they did not want to uh, remove the filter quite yet she was discharged to a sniff on lovenox and warfarin one compounding factor is that on about day five of her hospital stay she developed a fib and so from the neurologist standpoint then that was the cause of her stroke she was going to remain on anticoagulation lifelong however two weeks later when she presented with a therapeutic inr she had terrible left lower extremity edema and pain and the IR imaging demonstrated that her uh, left leg vein had occluded and they had planned a thrombectomy and wanted to remove um, a whole bunch of the IVC clot. And so after a long discussion, they decided to proceed to PFO closure to hopefully reduce her risk of a paradoxical embolus during that procedure. And here on the left, you can see, this was the um, original picture where you can see the filter in place, but there is a large amount of thrombus still in the filter. And then in the right, uh, on the right box there, you can see um, now her left leg is occluded. There may be some resolution in the thrombus uh, in the filter, and I thought about going through the right leg, but given the thrombus burden, I decided at this point this would be another good uh, case to come from the neck. So um, here's a look at her uh, TE on the day of the procedure, and you get the sense that it's actually perhaps a small fenestrated ASD. Uh, maybe a little bit of a mobile septum. Again, coming from the neck, the wire easily passed in this case. Um, I used a JR4, and then I ultimately uh, put a safari wire in the left ventricle and decided uh, because she was about to go for a uh, thrombectomy, hopefully in the next week, that using something that would fill up the defect uh, would be ideal to decrease her chances of embolizing something through. So I selected a 12 millimeter ASO device. And unfortunately, that passed very easily into the left atrium. So I went up to a 16 millimeter device and it appeared much more stable. These are just some pictures you can see here on echo, it appears very stable. Uh, the device was released. I felt pretty good about the results. You can see she has a negative bubble study. I went out to write orders and as I always do, I asked the tech to take one last x-ray and then unfortunately the device had had left and uh, that was an unfortunate thing fortunately the device was easily retrieved um, from the descending aorta it had, it had embolized into the descending aorta and after discuss you know de deciding what would be my best approach I actually ended up deciding to come and get femoral access so I actually did move through the IVC filter without difficulty from the right leg 
And you can see here um, then that the defect opens up quite significantly. So I had really been fooled coming from the neck approach on how big the actual defect was. So I ended up putting a 20 millimeter ASO device in and I did a very vigorous tug test and push test and uh, it turned out very well. And this is the image of the patient the next day. Approximately four days later, she went for a uh, thrombectomy and had, I didn't include those images, but had a removal of her filter and a removal of a large amount of thrombus and she'd done well. So I thought there were some key take home points that with the recent trial results regarding PFO closure, I think the number of people going to PFO closure is definitely going to increase. So those of us that are doing that procedure need to have an alternative approach plan for those patients. And uh, I would only caution you that uh, you have to be very careful when you're planning and sizing those. You can easily be fooled when you're coming, for, coming from the neck. And I guess the last piece is also that, as I did in that last case, most of these cases can easily be done through a filter. So thank you for your attention. Appreciate that. Thank you, Lee. Great okay. cases. Any questions from the audience? I got uh, one, two questions, really quick one. One is just technically, where do you end up putting the torque view once it's in? Do you leave it in the LA or, and before you deploy the LA disc or do you actually, you know, stabilize it in the LV and then pull it back and, because, you know, as you advance the, the AS, ASO through, it tends to shift quite a bit. Yeah, both, I, I'd much rather deploy it in the LA okay. if I can. The first case, it was much more difficult and I had to be almost in the LV. Um, but the second case, you know, I guess there was a little more room. It wasn't, it wasn't as hard. And I think one of the key things there, like you said, is just um, having good wire position and knowing where your wire is as you, as you unsheath it. And I think, you know, you bring up another good point is one of the reasons I selected this device is I think if you're going to try and do this from the neck, the de delivery system with this device is, is much more suitable to trying to deliver these yeah. fairly easily, at least from my experience. Have you done one with the no. cardioform? Has anybody no. done a cardioform from the neck? No. no. It's, it's a lot larger board. So, uh, with, uh, catheter, the sheet works quite well. Yeah. You can use the Agilis actually as the delivery sheath. Yeah. So if you have the steerable quad catheter, you can get that through, you can move the Agilis. At this, the, the time, and I, you could see by the fact that I used a cribiform device, I had not started in on MitroClip and anything, so I was just trying to find a way to get myself stable in the left atrium, so. The exact same thing happens with us. Every time we try to advance the sheath, the wires block, everything blocks back right, and back in the RA. Uh, but once you put the Agilis in, Yeah, we use an, uh, I, in this case, I used a multi-purpose, which did the same thing. It got me, it got me into the left side. So, thank you. Great. Great, thank you. We'll have our next speaker, so Paul Soraya, complex transcatheter mitral valve repair. It's always good to see the ones that don't turn out exactly how you want to as well. We, that's the purpose of these sessions, so thank you, Lee, for showing that. So I'm going to show you a case here, um, and I know uh, some of you may have seen this before, uh, but I think most of you probably have not. Uh, here are my disclosures. So this was an 85-year-old woman. Uh, she had had previous surgical repair uh, done elsewhere about eight years uh, before she came to see us. She was 85, she was a bit frail and clearly uh, symptomatic, uh, was essentially a class uh, three. She had a very difficult family, <laughs> and to say the least, I know, Susan, you may remember this family, uh, but, uh, but she really wanted something done, and uh, she pushed really hard, but this is what we were dealing with. So if you look here in the top left, you can see uh, that the posterior leaflet has been resected. Uh, she's got an annual plaster ring, uh, she's got some MR, uh, which you can see here, both in the LVOT and, uh, and the BICOM view. Uh, and you can see that uh, for uh, mitral clip purposes, uh, this anatomy uh, could be uh, quite challenging. Here's a, a, a 3D image, and you can see this uh, partial annual plastic ring. Uh, we tend to prefer complete rings. Uh, for whatever reason, she had a partial ring done elsewhere. And uh, as is quite common uh, with mitral valve surgery, she did have some elevated gradients. Here is a gradient of uh, two. Well, 
Well, the issue, okay, I'm not a surgeon, uh, but, but my understanding is that the issue with these is that the implantation did not go far enough to the trigones. Yeah, and exactly. Exactly. So, so that it slipped down or wasn't implanted. And so the remodeling happened that way. Absolutely. So, so here we're looking at this patient. She's desperate. She really doesn't want to avoid surgery. So we offer MitraClip. So I'll just show you in the interest of time of how we did it. Uh, now the key here is that the posterior leaflet had been resected. There's very little, uh, if any, uh, posterior leaflet tissue. So you got to think to yourself, well, what are you going to anchor the posterior arm of the clip to? Well, we're just going to find something uh, to anchor to. And the reason why uh, that's important is because when you do that, you want to have your transeptal uh, relatively posterior because you're going to be pulling the CDS uh, posteriorly uh, to grab whatever tissue uh, you can grab. And so here, we're going to go right down the middle because that's where most of the MR jet is. And here we've got the uh, clip lined up. And what you don't see before here is that essentially I've taken that posterior arm of the clip and essentially pushed it over as a bumper over the antiplasty ring. And that just tells me that I've gotten as posterior as I can, and then I pull as posterior as I can. And the posterior arm here is sitting on the antiplasty ring. And then we've closed uh, the clip, as you can see here. The posterior arm has a ring in it. There's an anterior leaflet in here. And the gradient, which to my chagrin, because I thought, you know, the gradient of two, I thought we we're going to end up with a gradient of eight, ten. It actually only went up to four. So uh, here, um, as uh, you know, one of the concerns is there's not a whole lot of tissue here, so I'm going to tug on this like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm tugging on this, making sure it's rock stable, because the last thing I want to do is see this go into the patient's head. And you, so here I'm tugging on it really hard, and you can see, uh, you know, there's the radiopaque portion of the, uh, the angioplasty band, but there's obviously the band that you can't see that the, the clip is anchored onto. And after we're quite happy with how this is secure, uh, you can see here that uh, we've left it behind. And this is the final result. And so you can see here the uh, clip is, is on the aneuplasty band and the anterior leaflet. Uh, the MR has been completely relieved. And if you look at this, uh, that anterior leaflet has been brought over uh, onto the posterior ring here. And this is the, the color flow showing uh, the res uh, improvement in the MR. Now this was done uh, a few years ago, and looking back, you know, this, you know, this amount of tethering, you might think maybe we should have considered putting another clip in here. I think I probably would, just to make sure that the anchor uh, of this would be secure so that we don't end up with an SLDA. Uh, but again, to, to my pleasant surprise, she's done very well uh, in terms of her MR therapy. So key points, uh, go very posterior uh, if you have posterior leaflet that's deficient or absent. Uh, you always want to be wary of uh, stenosis because with surgery, it's going to be a downsized aneuplasty uh, when they do surgeries. It's always going to be smaller than the native. And in this patient, you know, I had some concerns about this uh, valve being small. But if you look here, look at the pressure half time. Uh, a major reason why this patient's gradient was elevated was not because of the MS, but because of the MR, uh, because the pressure half time is actually very, very short here. So. That can also give you a clue as to whether stenosis is going to be a problem. So thank you very much. A, a great case, Paul, and uh, thank you. We saw you uh, do this before. So my quick question was, I was expecting the mitre clip to have a little bit more wider uh, with the uh, ring inside. Yeah. And I want to comment, I wanted to see how, how much it pulls the anterior leaflet and how much the wideness of the clip should be. And fluoroscopy didn't look that wide. Yeah, you're right. And I don't know if it's because maybe I wasn't truly on the antiplasty ring. And maybe I, I just grabbed some posterior leaflet tissue and cords, and that's really what we're anchoring to. And maybe I shouldn't be saying that we were on the ring. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really can't do that. Right. Yeah. So that's, a, that's exactly what we did. We just hoped that whatever tissue there was, yeah, that we grabbed. So that's a great point for, for doing this. Just grab whatever you can't see. <laughs> so. Right. I guess we don't really know the long-term durability of doing this, but no. uh, you know, I, I think you'll have to be really cautious and, and really certain that you have a really good grasp on the anterior yeah. leaflet in these cases. Absolutely. Yeah. Great Thanks, everyone.
The next speaker is uh, Dr. Gagan Singh. He's going to talk to us about challenging transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I was actually not sure I do have some disclosures, but nothing relevant to, to this presentation. So uh, Paul asked me to present a, a challenging case of transcatheter mitral valve replacement, and I kind of had to think about you know, what replacement means in the current era, and the, and the whole definition of replacement in the mitral position continues to evolve. You know, we, we saw a case of uh, complex valve and valve case earlier, but you know, there's valve and ring, valve and MAC, and then there's a traditional full-on valve replacement where you take a, a structure and put it inside the mitral valve, and the native mitral valve, and, and you know, we have tendine and trepid, and obviously there's other things that are in the pipeline, such as uh, M3 and, and 4C, but you know, we, we haven't done our tendine yet, probably hopefully in the next couple of months uh, we'll do our first tendine case, but I thought we'd talk a little bit about a, of a, a complex valve and ring case we did recently, and, and I saw Danny in here earlier, hopefully he's still in here, I'd love to, to get his input on this case. It was, a, it was a young female, 69, but she was 69 going on 99. Um, she had multiple comorbidities. A little over a decade ago, she underwent uh, an annualplasty ring, a number 26 physio, uh, and also went a tricuspid annualplasty at that time. Um, She's had recurrent recent CHF admissions over about six to eight months or so, and her transthoracic showed that now she had severe bioprosthetic MR, and then she also had some mitral stenosis. Um, her transthoracic echo, uh, again, confirmed that there was uh, regurgitation. There's flow convergence in diastole, uh, consistent with some um, transmitral gradient. The gradient was about eight, which may or may not be terribly uh, abnormal for this type of valve. Um, and here are some transesophageal echo images kind of confirming the same. There's there's this very eccentric kind of abnormal uh, appearing regurgitant uh, jet uh, in this giant left atrium uh, that was uh, uh, performed about a little over a decade ago. So, you know, we kind of met with her. Her STS score was, was certainly above eight. She had substantial pulmonary disease, very small, frail lady. Her rehab potential was, was pretty poor, especially for a, for a sternotomy, but also for a transapical approach. We really felt she would not tolerate that that well. So we ended up uh, electing a, a femoral venous, a transeptal puncture, and then try to deliver a Sapien S3 system uh, under rapid pacing. So this is from the valve and valve app, and, and as I learned, you know, in the pro and during this case, you know, these are semi-rigid rings, uh, the Physio 1, and, and the, the alloy is a, a cobalt chromium alloy, and they're generally rigid along here anteriorly, and then they're, they're uh, a little bit more flexible here in the posterior uh, section of it, and, and this is kind of what it looks like on the bench top, and then or and then uh, under fluoroscopy when you're looking at it on FOSS. Um, the valve and valve app recommends a, a size of uh, 23 on the Sapien uh, system. Um, and this is kind of what it would look like uh, once it's deployed. Uh, you know, you're trying to look for at least a 70-30. Uh, here under fluoroscopy, you may even look 60-40. Uh, and then with the understanding that, again, the shortening occurs from the atrial side down once you're deploying it. Now, we also routinely do our own CTs and our own reconstructions, and, and you know, we're getting diameters of about 24 to 17 uh, with an average of about 20 or so. And, and in her particular case, the new LVT was not a concern, um, so we weren't really uh, too concerned about that. She had a, a ventricle that could tolerate it. So we performed a transeptal uh, puncture uh, posteriorly, uh, dilated the interatrial septum, and then uh, we created an LV rail. And this is an important point for discussion because I think you know, if you're able to externalize it through an apical hole, you get better coaxiality uh, when you're trying to deploy the device. Other people have kind of taken it out the aortic valve and kind of snared it and then kind of used the femoral vein to, to maintain some degree of coaxiality. Uh, but that, that is one of the limitations of, of, of this type of uh, replacement. Um, and, and as you can see, it may have caused some problem down the line. So um, as was mentioned earlier by Dominic, you know, the, the sheath you cannot advance it all the way in. You have to leave it out and you actually mount the valve uh, inside the IVC. And she had a very big left atrium, so we had to use this banking technique, uh, you know, kind of banked off the posterior wall of the aorta and to finally bring it across, across the ring and, and began to put it into appropriate position. So, so here we are. We kind of understand the, the, the marker, the middle dot marker is kind of at the level of the ring, but the, most of the shortening is going to occur from the atrial side down. And again, we're shooting for about, you know, 70, 30, uh, 30 on the atrial side, maybe 40. Uh, we'll tolerate that. And, and LVOT obstruction was, was, again, not a concern for her. So we're beginning a rapid pace here on the bottom left, and uh, the balloon is beginning to inflate. Kind of we're making micro adjustments as we can. And, and so far, everything looks, looks pretty darn good. Um, kind of like the positioning. Uh, we can see that the parallax, we're losing some of the parallax. So, so the valve has shifted a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, we go ahead and take it. And uh, this is kind of what it looks like afterwards. We do have a nice hourglass figure. There is a parallax, so maybe on one side we really are 70-30, but on the other we may be closer to 50-50. Um, and this is the echo right afterwards. So what we have is, you know, the, the, the valve itself is nice and well seated. However, there is pretty substantial paravalvar insufficiency, uh, or in this case, 
repair a ring uh, insufficiency. I mean, the, between the ring and the prosthetic valve, there is no insufficiency, but probably the ring itself dehisced from the tissue as part of our deployment. So what is a mechanism? You know, the one, one mechanism is, is that, you know, you're taking a round structure and putting it into an oval, uh, oval structure. And so that creates a lot of tension on the ring itself and pulls it away from the tissue. And certainly that can contribute uh, to formation of, uh, um, uh, formation of this, this para ring insufficiency. And a lot of that may have to do with coaxiality. And, and you know, we're, we're learning more and more about valve and valve and valve and ring. Um, you know, if you look at, at Danny's, uh, uh, at, least the, at least the data he presented last year, you know, about a third or 80, he had like 80 patients or so, and the vast majority of them had the Edwards physio ring. Um, and one of the mechanisms is coaxiality. Now, if you look, we normally look at it in the RAO projection where we have the ring lined up, and we think that we're totally perpendicular, but we usually don't look at an on-foss view, because in the on-foss view, we still could be not coaxial. This is kind of what we would ideally like to achieve, but you could tolerate this too, and you could probably tolerate that, but what you can't tolerate is when it's canted off the side, and you really can't tell that when you're looking at it just from the side, and you really need an on phos view, and whether that's you know, 3D uh, TE or, or whether that's fluoro, you know, you can use that, but, but even if you have detected it, well, how do you achieve that coaxiality, especially if you don't have an apical um, uh, extrusion in the rail coming out the apex side? So this continues to be a challenge uh, for these valve and ring procedures, and so, here, this is on the left. You'll see right before we started to deploy, this is where the position is, and look at the ring. It's, it's totally perfect, uh, uh, perfectly in plane, and then as soon as you see the ring with maximum deployment, the ring is totally shifted. So we really lifted it off, um, off where it's, it's base, uh, and, and likely, again, because of lack of coaxiality is probably what did it. Um, so even if that does happen, you know, we're, we're, we kind of detected the mechanism. At this point, what do you do? Uh, you know, we elected to proceed with uh, para ring closure. We were able to get an agilla sheath in there, use 3D guidance to get two uh, glide wires across here on the left image, and then ultimately uh, we sized the def defect uh, with the help of transesophageal echo imaging, and we went ahead and, and deployed two uh, AVPs. Uh, and uh, this is kind of the final picture. You do have to confirm both in the on foss and the side view that you're truly not through. Um, um, uh, through the valve, uh, and you want to be, and not actually also through one of the open cells in the ventricular side, uh, you were in the appropriate position. So we had good deployment. Uh, on the left here is the pre, on the right you see post uh, uh, valve and ring, and then finally after the AVP went in, uh, we had good seal uh, of that para ring leak. So uh, 23 Sapien S3 valve and ring, we put two vascular plugs in and then, and then a crib uh, to close it on the way out. So. So, uh, you know, I think for these uh, valve and ring procedures, I think um, uh, these uh, transfemoral transeptal approach uh, is certainly feasible. These para ring leaks, um, I think, are also feasible, but that is one of the limitations currently of the valve and ring procedure. The mechanism we talked about is, is just not, coax not having appropriate coaxiality, and, and even if you do detect it ahead of time, trying to get that coaxiality without having an apical uh, rail is, is challenging, and then obviously just, just the sheer fact that you're taking a, a round structure and, and putting it inside of an oval structure and trying to, to make it conform to that can be difficult. So the patient fortunately did well, and, and she did great, but again, this highlights uh, some of the, the issues that we continue to have with the valve and ring procedures. So thank you. Just a, one quick comment. Yeah. A great, I think having two wires across and deploying two is a great alternative there. What we have in Canada, we have the AVP3, which is more oblong for period device leaks. So, nice. you know, typically we just use one to one. start, but great case though. Yep. Thank you very Thanks. much. So the next speaker is my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Saw. She's going to talk to us about therapy of no rim ASD. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Talak. And thanks, uh, Paul, for having me here today. I'm going to go back old school and talk about ASD closure and show some of our disasters. I would preface it by saying that these are really early cases a few years ago, um, and I like to think that we learned uh, since then. No relevant disclosures. As you know, that um, you know, secondary ASD accounts for about 70% of all ASDs, and these are the only ones that we can close percutaneously. But despite that, still only about 80% can be closed percutaneously, and the remainder should be closed uh, surgically. The reported complications are device embolization in about 1 in 200 cases, and erosion is a lot lower, but can be reported up to 0.3% of cases. And these are some of the challenging anatomies. When we do ASD closures, most of us think this is usually pretty straightforward, but if you encounter really large ASDs, or especially those with floppy septum or tough orientation of a septum, and especially those for the purpose of this talk, having no rim or deficient rim defined as less than five millimeters can really make uh, the device closure more challenging. 
And typically, the location of these uh, rims that are deficient are uh, anterior superior or the aortic retroaortic rim and posterior. If you look at uh, some of the older series here, in primarily in children, 640 cases, when you look at um, ASDs that are deferred for surgery, uh, about 37% or so are due to deficient rims, and in children it's primarily in the posterior inferior part uh, and some in the anterior, in the aortic part. And in adults, uh, in this series from 440 ASD uh, in Greece, uh, patients ranging from age from 3 to 52, 42% were deficient in terms of rims, and 30% were in the aortic position, and 12% in the posterior position. So with that in mind, let me show you a couple of cases. The first example here um, was, a, was a gentleman in his 30s, and uh, we offered him surgical uh, closure, but he refused that. And you can see uh, from the baseline TEE that there was really not a lot of aortic rim. Um, and on TEE, it measured about 18 millimeters. Uh, not only that, but if you look at the septum, it's actually quite floppy uh, as well. Uh, so we embarked on this procedure. Again, this was uh, several years back, and uh, using ISIS guidance, uh, we did uh, stop for a balloon, 21 millimeter, um, so we decided to go with a uh, 24 millimeter um, implant susceptible occluder device, and using ISIS guidance, it was relatively straightforward, we didn't really um, uh, worry about, uh, we didn't actually see the left-sided disc um, slipping back into the right side, uh, we were pretty comfortable uh, with the position and uh, we didn't see any color flow going across, uh, and we felt comfortable with that, and we released the device. But unfortunately, in the next day, um, this is where the device ended up, and um, fortunately for a lot of these devices uh, that have embolized into the aorta, uh, it's usually pretty straightforward to retrieve them, uh, simply using a gooseneck snare uh, and over a diagnostic five French catheter, um, usually pretty straightforward to grab uh, one of these end screws and uh, get it down to the large sheath. Uh, for this particular case, we, we just had a short sheath down below. Um, I believe this was a 14 French sheath. Um, couldn't get coaxial too much. Uh, it was a bit of a challenge trying to get it coaxial. After a bit of manipulation, uh, we were able to just, with a lot of force, uh, just pull uh, this whole device back into position into back into the sheath and um, having just you know, pre-close uh, for this uh, femoral arterial puncture wasn't too much of an issue and then we went back in uh, with a 30 millimeter device this time and um, this time we definitely did a tug maneuver to make sure the device was stable and there was no color flow across um, uh, the hole on the ice catheter and here is a little tug maneuver, maneuver here, and the patient did well for this case. And here's a second example of uh, women in their 30s, and um, baseline TEE shows uh, the measurement here about 23 millimeters for the defect. Uh, when you look at the SVC rim, it was measuring 5.7, and the aortic rim 6.4. Uh, so we felt this was reasonable to attempt percutaneously. And um, so we started off uh, balloon sizing and we end, ended up measuring 28, decided to be a little bit more liberal and went with a 32 millimeter device uh, to start. And we, with the eyes guidance, the images weren't very good. This was a few years back. Uh, we didn't see color going across the device and um, feeling relatively comfortable with that in, that in this position, only a projection the device was uh, released, but um, unfortunately, this was what happened right after. <laughs> so we weren't quite as lucky with this case. Uh, we attempted retrieval from various um, uh, positions here, starting off from the um, IVC, using, even using a, a gooseneck stair didn't work, use a biotone didn't work, tried from the IJ, just couldn't grab a hole of the device. And uh, this was a few years ago, so I think we attempted we're trying to retrieve this for about an hour, and at the end of it, uh, decided to give up. And in the surgical report, uh, this was a large secundum ASD with minimal rim inferiorly and no rim superiorly, and the ASD was uh, measuring a fair bit larger than what our measurement was. So certainly these cases really 
could uh, go to surgical uh, uh, retrieval and, and closure. So some of the advanced techniques for deficient rims uh, that have been reported so you can utilize, such as placing the sheath in the left upper pulmonary vein and deploying the, 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 your left-sided disc partially in the vein and then moving back your sheath into the right side and then to, uh, forming this sort of uh, American football um, uh, configuration and then yanking the device out and then very and then simultaneous grabbing onto the septum with the left side of this and the right side of this can pre prevent prolapse uh, for cross aortic rim. There are some other approaches that's been described using a tulip bulb, basically positioning the sheath in the right upper pulmonary vein first and enabling you to then have a more coaxial alignment with the sheath uh, for aortic rim deficiency. Other maneuvers, like a Greek maneuver, where you deploy not only the left-sided disc on the left atrium, but also two-thirds of the right uh, atrial disc, and then moving it back against the septum. This forces the left disc to become parallel to the septum to prevent protrusion. This is useful for both aortic or posterior rim deficiency. And there's some other techniques as well for posterior rim deficiency, partially deploying the left-sided disc in the right upper pulmonary vein. Uh, would prevent prolapse uh, posteriorly. And another technique is the left atrial roof uh, technique where you push the left side of the roof disc against the roof of the left atrium and then deploy the right atrial disc and then pulling back the left atrial disc. More complicated uh, uh, approaches include using the sizing balloon on the right side of the atrium to prevent prolapse of the left-sided disc. Obviously, this will require a second femoral puncture. What some operators have done as well is to use the dilator uh, to put it across the atrial septal defect, this will prevent prolapse of the left-sided disc, uh, so you can uh, attempt that. Or very simply, just change the sheath angulation. There is a specific, you know, Hausdorff sheath allows you to keep the aortic edge of the left-sided disc posteriorly, so it doesn't prolapse through for aortic rim deficiency. Or even just doing your own babbling of your sheath to direct your left-sided disc more parallel uh, to the septum to prevent prolapse. So these are different approaches uh, you can do. Uh, I want to just to be brief, so in, in summary, no deficient rims can make your uh, ASD closure challenging and think about device embolization as a potential complication and consider surgery as an option. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any last questions? I think uh, we're running out of time, but uh, maybe you can spend five to ten minutes off your lunch so we can have a couple of questions, I guess. Do you think that um, better imaging with TE would have been helpful to predict that you were going to embolize or were undersized? I find imaging the entirety of the septum very difficult with ice, especially with a device in place. I just wonder if you... For sure, learning from a mistake is, I think, especially for the second case, when I'm looking back at the ice images, I'm not sure we just we didn't store it very well as well, but they, I think that we didn't quite get the best stop flow as, uh, for that particular case. So for challenging cases like this, I think using TE instead of ice certainly makes a lot of sense. Jack, do you have any concerns about deficient posterior rims and the risk of erosion down, downstream? I mean, that's kind of one of my biggest worries. I mean, I think there are a lot of techniques to deploy it, but the ones with posterior rims, I'm really worried about late yeah. erosion. Right. I think also the division aortic rim is the more concern when it erodes through into yeah. the aorta as well. Yes, I, I think in those cases we tend to oversize a little bit more yeah. just to keep in the device more stable. Uh, there, you know, certainly there's that association between Sorry. contact, you know, with the aorta and, and the risk of erosion. So we haven't seen these cases in, in the examples that we've had, yeah. but that's certainly we should, you know, be concerned about. Uh, I have actually a quick question for Dominic, actually. So a great case, Dominic, uh, that you presented. So um, as you all know, FDA approval for pulmonary valve replacement right now is for conduits and um, uh, prior valves. Uh, so it's almost a native REOT that you're deploying. So the sizing question I had was uh, imaging probably would not give you the right sizing because you have to balloon size it because the compliance of the native REOT is different from a conduit. So as you rightly did, balloon size to make sure the lady is not obstructed. So the only comment I had was, were, were you considering pre-stenting there? Because uh, we don't know what happens to these valves in long term because the stent fracture is a huge possibility here. So um, stent fracture is absolutely one of the biggest limitations of the, of the CP stent, which is what the malady valve um, is mounted inside the bovine jugular vein is sutured inside the CP stent. That's an inherently... Um, it's a platinum stent, which is very soft, and those are very prone to fracture. So for all of our malady cases, we pre-stent um, with one, usually two Palmaz XLs. Um, the, the stent frame of the Sapien valves is 
uh, it's it's it was stainless steel and um, and now it's a it's a cobalt if I'm not mistaken, um, and that's a much stronger metal and we have not had. I've not seen any reports of stent fracture without pre-stenting of the sapien valve, and that's been our approach, is to not pre-stent um, native RBOTs or conduits, uh, homographs with the sapien valve. But with Melody, absolutely pre-stent pretty much all, um, aside from, you know, bioprostheses, which Fantastic. you don't have to, yeah. All right, I think. I guess. No further questions. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Thank you.